Hi, good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to our uh, EE colloquium and the second Lytle lecture this year, uh, which is given by Professor David Donahoe from Stanford. It's a great honor to host Professor Donahoe, and uh, especially la yesterday's talk, some of you may have been there. Our Lytle lecture this year broke the records of attendance, so we are very, very thankful to Professor Donahoe for visiting us. Um, and uh, it, as I said, it's a great honor. I was a student at Stanford University and benefited a lot from Professor Donahoe as a member of my PhD committee. So it's a personal honor as well. Uh, Professor Donahoe got his bachelor's degree uh, from Princeton University working with John Twickey and his PhD from Harvard working with Peter Huber. Um, and then he was a faculty member at UC Berkeley for a while, then moved to Stanford University Statistics Department where he is the Anne and Robert uh, Bass Professor. And uh, one thing that is important and came across in yesterday's talk as well is that he's an early visionary of the field known as compressed sensing and more broadly, the role of sparsity and sparse methods in signal processing and statistics. Um, some early papers that he had in, in, in this topic are very heavily cited. There's a 2006 paper on, called compressed sensing you may have seen and in Google Scholar it has more than 16,000 citations. Um, some other early articles as well played a huge role. One uh, that is on basis pursuit in 2001 um, has more than 8,000 citations. Um, there are many awards that Professor Donahoe has won. I will mention only a few. So he's a MacArthur Fellow, that's in, back in 91. Um, he won the uh, Committee of Presidents of Statistical Society Award, the big award in statistics, in 94. The von Neumann Prize in, uh, from Siam in uh, 2001. Norbert Wiener Prize in Applied Mathematics from Siam and AMS uh, in 2010. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences of the US, a uh, foreign member of French Academy of Sciences. And he has a lot of honorary degrees as well. I think the most recent one was from University of Waterloo maybe a week ago or so. So a uh, very long list of illustrious uh, awards uh, marking his work. So we are very pleased to hear today on the more technical side of his work about shrinkage of singular values. Please. Uh, well, thanks very much for uh, First of all, all the hospitality that I've received while here, I wanted to thank Mariam Fazel for everything she's done to organize the visit. I've been very impressed by the actually quite large audiences that I've seen, and I've had so many fascinating discussions. I would say in the last five years, I haven't had a 24-hour period with so many really fascinating discussions. There's a lot happening in the field broadly spanning from statistics across the mathematical sciences into the engineering sciences. There's just so many uh, developments. Everyone wants to know about deep learning, data science, uh, what does it mean to have big data in the cloud and so on and so forth. This is really a crucial set of months really in which a lot of things are happening. Um, uh, this talk uh, obviously can't possibly plug into all of that, which would be uh, just an Im impossibly vague task in any event. Uh, the, the larger theme than the specific technicalities that I'm going to discuss is that uh, in, let's say, the last 10 years, uh, statisticians and information theorists have been very interested in problems that deviate from the traditional types of statistical problems. In the traditional environment, what you had was matrices that were of some fixed width and that gave you your data, and then they got taller and taller as more and more data came in. And there was a whole regime of how to analyze problems where uh, the tallness of the matrix grew and there were, you know, uh, uh, classical tomes on this and so on and so forth. And in the last 10 years, people have been letting the matrices stay of some fixed aspect ratio and just grow bigger, uh, maintaining the aspect ratio. And that's led to utterly new phenomena everywhere you look. So basically, in, in any procedure of data analysis, anything coming out of classical statistics but adapted into this new setting, you find that 
the right way to proceed is utterly different than uh, what we were taught when we grew up, so to speak. So that's the larger trend, and I, I would say that uh, you know, all procedures of traditional statistical analysis are on the table and are being very energetically reworked in order to take this all into account. So if you, if you can uh, somehow relate to those impossibly vague things that I just said, then this is an example of a large trend that's going on in statistics. You will have seen the same trend, for example, in, in wireless communications implicitly in the middle of proofs and so on and so forth. Many of the same calculations that I'll be talking about here do occur uh, on quite a few pages of, say, IEEE IT transactions, uh, but it's, it's somehow in a different setting. It may be implicit. You may not have been aware of it. So this is an attempt to uh, make you aware of a whole new class of asymptotics for problems that uh, were traditionally never considered, but now in the era of big data seem very relevant. Okay, so that's a mouthful. Uh, there's a variety of things I'm going to mention here by uh, several contributors. Some of these like uh, uh, Edgar Dobrybon and Beruz Gorbani are current graduate students at Stanford. Ian Johnstone is my longtime collaborator on the faculty. Matan Gavish was my PhD student who's now at the Hebrew University. Uh, some of the things that I'll talk about include the following which uh, are papers that are out there. And then this paper is finished, but it hasn't quite been put on archive. And uh, I'll just refer to a variety of these things. I'll also mention that uh, statistics has traditionally been an orphan subject, that uh, there were the people who did statistics who loved it and thought that you know, figuring out how to make inferences from data was a great thing. Um, but uh, even in some of our core reference works, there were self-deprecating comments. If you look in uh, the Advanced Guide to Statistics by uh, Yule and Kendall, uh, go into, into volume two and look at the dedication quote just after the title page. Uh, it's something taken out of an English novel where uh, uh, a classy woman meets a statistician and says uh, that she was very surprised to see the statistician was married. She had no idea that actually statisticians reproduced. She imagined, <laughs> she imagined that they, if at all, were some sort of uh, offspring, barren uh, organism like mules. So, we now have an award, which is called the International Prize in Statistics. And the first one was given a couple of weeks ago to Sir David Cox, who pioneered uh, a lot of important techniques that are used uh, heavily in the analysis of lifetime survival data. Um, the, it's, uh, it's an attempt by statisticians to get some recognition. And I thought you might not have heard of it. Uh, by all means, David Cox, if you've never heard of him, you should maybe expand your horizons. Um, the, the thing is, I was on the committee that was the exploratory committee to form this prize. So I feel that at least you know, the committee work over a period of years achieved something to actually get the thing uh, funded and the first one awarded to really, uh, well, an excellent person who certainly deserved his knighthood. Uh, so now to some tech technical issues. Uh, there's a ubiquitous process in science and technology that you will have seen many times already in your uh, research careers. We obtain a data matrix, rectangular, complete data set. And we look at either the Gram matrix, Y prime Y, or we just look at Y itself. If we look at the Gram matrix, we take the eigenvalue decomposition. And if we look at Y itself, we take the singular value decomposition. Then uh, the core matrix in, in each of those decompositions 
will have either eigenvalues or singular values. We're going to plot those in a reverse sort from largest to smallest. And there will be some big ones that stick out, and there will be some small ones that uh, we want to ignore and pay no attention to. So we look for the heavy hitters among the eigenvalues, and we try to see what they mean. Uh, this particular paradigm of processing data has been out there for many years. The formal statement of it in a way that's citable and we can track down goes back at least 50 years to the introduction of the so-called scree plot by uh, Raymond Cattell, who was then at the University of Illinois. On the right-hand side, you can see an example of this where we have eigenvalues plotted on the y-axis, and we've got the uh, sequence number of the eigenvalue here. They're in a reverse sort going down in that way. What you see is that there are some very large eigenvalues that actually don't fit on the plot but are indicated uh, in an old-fashioned notation that there's just, you know, there's, they're somehow above the, the space of the plotting axis. Try to do that in MATLAB, actually. It's not so easy. Um, but uh, then there's a couple that are still pretty big compared to the others. And then the others are somehow magically along a line. And what uh, Cattell said at the time is, uh, the ones that fall along the line are the ones that you should ignore, pay no attention to. And the ones that stick out and are not along the line, those correspond to something real and signal that we should pay attention to. So there are many thousands of citations. And uh, for a paper that's been around 50 years, to be getting 8,000 Google Scholar citations is uh, pretty impressive because ordinarily you might think that, uh, well, the, this method became so widely established. And on top of it, it's a totally vague concept, like look at a plot and look for an elbow. You know, well, how could you even get 8,000 citations for something that's that vague? But in fact, it's, it's happened in the modern era. Um, you can look around and find a variety of different applications of this on a weekly basis. So uh, here's a simple example from Nature Photonics, where some uh, applied physicists uh, do some analysis. And uh, it's not important for us to understand in detail here. I'm just putting up something that, il that illustrates that you can open up a random journal and you can find an application of this uh, live in action. In this particular case, the scree plot is over here. It's turned on its side. And instead of showing eigenvalues, you're showing singular values, which of course are the square roots. This is very little difference between the two things notionally. Uh, you notice that there's something that looks like an elbow. And you look, notice that the things that stick up above the elbow are colored. And then there's heat maps that are keyed into those colors uh, over here, which are showing the, the uh, singular vectors so that you can understand where the, at which indices the entries of the singular vectors are large. In this talk, we won't be paying that much attention to this part of it, except that we'll describe theory about the accuracy of singular vectors. But we're just at the moment saying, look, there's you know applied physicists. They're doing exactly a scree plot and following the paradigm. Any questions? Uh, here's an example from you know, the other end of the sciences, uh, a, a nice paper with uh, first author John Novambra and a number of other important contributors include Katarzyna Brick, who is now 23, and me. And these are out of some very well-known productive labs in CompBio. Uh, the title, as you can see, is about the fact that you can see the geography of residents of human populations in the genome. We'll start with saying what, the, what they uh, had in this data set was SNP data, where for each of uh, a few thousand individuals, they have, let's say in round figures, something like a quarter million uh, 
SNP measurements. So there's a matrix that's a few thousand by a quarter million, and they compute the eigenvalues of the underlying gram matrix. And when you, when you do that, you see something like this, that there's indeed this sort of straight line. In this particular case, there's one eigenvalue that's fiducially zero because of a mean subtraction operation, which we can ignore. And then there's some eigenvalues that stick up. Uh, and you know we're, we're exactly following the paradigm according to this. Now, what's, what's maybe more memorable than the paradigm is that in this case, the eigenvectors have an interesting interpretation. If you look at the top two eigenvectors and uh, think of those as giving you, so, so for this kind of matrix, the eigenvectors would, there would be as many entries as in an eigenvector as persons. And so if you thought of those two eigenvectors as being just concatenated as columns in a matrix, then each row is a person and there's two numbers per person. If we take the two numbers, the loading on the first and the second eigenvector, then each person is mapped into a plane of a Cartesian space. And then each person becomes a dot in that plane. Now, we know some external descriptors of the individuals, not only their ge genetic information, we know what country they're residents of, we know other things about them, so on and so forth. So what, what's happened here is that uh, these, these individuals' positions in the plane have been, have been rendered using uh, those two coordinates from the eigenvectors, and then in addition, uh, a map of Europe has been superposed. The, the points are colored according to country of citizenship. And then in addition, there are means for each country indicating the typical uh, location that uh, an individual of a given citizenship was given. So uh, these are people largely Italians. That's the mean of the Italians, the mean of the Swiss, the mean of Portuguese and Spanish, et cetera, et cetera. What, the, 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 the key point is that it's all genetic information that led to the positioning of these people in the two-dimensional space. So it's the, the eigenvectors of these things coming out of the genome are giving us the locations the locations correlate rather markedly with the actual residence of the individuals. Sorry? I uh, don't know. That one there? It could be that they had such a small sample size that the mean is quite wild for some of the uh, less populous countries. Uh, which is a finding that we know from elementary statistics, but I, I can't claim, you know. So most, most of the countries are where they should be, but uh, as has been pointed out, not all. Um, and we'll come back to this picture. There's actually more layers of structure that we can come to. If, if you go into this uh, presentation of the individuals in a plane, uh, zooming in in the region around Switzerland, and you just look at uh, which individuals are from the parts of Switzerland that speak individual languages. So there's a, a French Swiss, German Swiss, Italian Swiss. In fact, maybe there's the fourth language Romance, but maybe they didn't have individuals from that group. Uh, in any event, you, you can see that even there, the genomic information is positioning people accurately in a certain sense. So it's actually, you know, in the modern genome is information about, you know, where your ancestors must have come. Is this, this wouldn't work in the US, I feel, but uh, I can't be sure. Maybe someone has done it. So there's an important, so in, in, uh, in, in what we've just done, we use this version that I mentioned where we interpret 
the big eigenvalues and the eigenvectors associated with them, and we ignore the smaller ones. Now there's the, the dual process, where we do everything the same, but we ignore the big eigenvalues and we interpret the others. And, and that's also a ubiquitous process. Here's an example from some researchers at uh, University of Washington, in fact. So Evan Eichler's lab has a paper on processing copy number variation data. And uh, just jumping to the money chart here, uh, they're describing a whole processing that they do. The key point uh, is that if, if you plot copy number variation along the x-axis and copy number signal along the y-axis, you get something that looks very noisy. Each person is a curve. Uh, and in particular, a signal that they're looking for in a particular place doesn't stick out very well above the noise because the noise is so high. However, that, that noise appearance is something that is accounted for by uh, uh, their sort of artifacts in the measurement process. And those show up as the uh, initial eigenvectors. And so if you subtract them out, you get rid of the, of the artifacts. So here they, they illustrate the idea. You take the uh, singular value decomposition. It's, again, a matrix that has a limited number of individuals and a gigantic number of copy number variation uh, data. You get a small number of singular values. You set some of them to 0, keep the others, and then uh, rebuild the, the uh, quasi-data matrix, now the noise level has gone down and the signal that you're looking for sticks up rather dramatically compared to that. So that's an idea that says that the large eigenvectors are all caused by uh, some common noise sources. And we want to remove that noise so that stuff that signal will pick up. You also see that in empirical finance, to which we'll return later. Uh, in this particular paper, they indeed have our friend the scree plot. They even call it the scree plot and uh, make the same comments that, oh my goodness, there's something small and then there's something big. There's an elbow. There's a few things that matter. And we're going to take the few things that matter. In this case, we view them as noise. We get rid of them, et cetera. OK, so that's the paradigm used in two different ways, used in a variety of sciences. And uh, the story can go on and on. That's how you get to. 9,000 citations on a paper that's 50 years, you know, current Google Scholar citations on something that's 50 years old. So we've got 50 years of this ideology very widely distributed throughout the community of science and technology. Uh, on the other hand, there's been a lot of work in applied probability, uh, theoretical probability, and mathematical statistics over the last 15 years or so, which has led us to understand quite a bit more about the eigenvalues of these large covariance matrices. And based on that, we can understand uh, there are some you know, systematic flaws in Scree-style thinking that we can now correct. And so uh, what I want to tell you about is how to do better than the Scree plot-style thinking and either protect yourself from noise that's embedded in the eigenvectors or biases that are embedded in the eigenvalues. So let's go into a bit of random matrix theory that's developed in recent years. So first of all, we'll just consider a specially normalized noise matrix. So it'll be m by n, rectangular and we'll normalize it so that the columns have approximately Euclidean norm 1. Uh, and we'll assume that there's a well-defined asymptotic shape in such a way that n over m goes to beta. Beta can be any number between 0 and infinity. Uh, but sort of because of the transposability of some of the concerns that we have, you would be fine to just think of beta as some number between 0 and 1 and interchange rows and columns in your thinking. 
Um, the singular value decomposition applied to such a matrix is going to give us an orthogonal matrix and then a diagonal core of the decomposition and other partial orthogonal matrix. An eigen decomposition of the Gram matrix would give us the same orthogonal matrix and a diagonal. Uh, there's obviously a linkage between these such that, for example, the singular values squared give you eigenvalues. When the matrix has a name like cap Z or cap X or cap Y, we may call the, the singular values like little Z or little X or little Y. Um, so a now classical result about the eigen decomposition, so that, that last example is just pure noise, right? So it, it's been known now for about 50 years what the eigenvalues of pure noise are going to look like. Depending on the shape factor beta of the matrix, the eigenvalues that you observe in the empirical eigen analysis are going to have some defined shape. Now, realize that the data that we're dealing with here have a theoretical covariance matrix with theoretical eigenvalues that are all 1.0. Everything here is, is Gaussian white noise. So uh, the fact that there's anything happening here away from one is of paramount concern. Namely, the underlying theoretical eigenvalues are concentrated exactly here. You should see a Dirac if your intuition that a empirical covariance matrix is giving you information about the theoretical one. But you're not seeing that. What you're seeing is that depending on the shape factor that you're dealing with, the eigenvalues spread out such that only a tiny fraction uh, are you know, within shouting distance of the true underlying theoretical value, and the rest are just spread out. Uh, granted, according to a defined limiting shape. That shape is called the Marchenko-Pasteur uh, density, and there's one of those for each shape factor. So, uh, you know, if you, if you do this at home, you, you can write a three-line piece of code in MATLAB and do this. Uh, if you make a histogram of the eigenvalues of some uh, you know, use uh, rand, rand n of, of n comma n to fill out your matrix, and then you uh, get the singular values uh, of that matrix or the eigenvalues of the gram that corresponds to it. You can make simple histograms with MATLAB, say, and you might see something like this. The, the claim is that this histogram, if we get a large enough problem size, and we uh, let the bins of the histogram get appropriately narrow, it's eventually going to reproduce this curve exactly. Um, well, we're not in the business of studying noise alone. We're in the business of studying signal that unfortunately has noise attached to it. And so what we really want to understand is not just the Marchenko-Pasteur density, but we want to understand what would happen if there were actually some signal uh, you know, folded in. Uh, how would the whole picture uh, develop? So if we imagine that we start with the noise we were talking about and then color it by putting a covariance operating from the right where the noise is exactly the same type that we were talking about before, and now the covariance, well, by uh, some orthogonal invariance properties, we can just assume that we're in the eigenbasis of the theoretical covariance, and then we only have to you know, uh, pay attention to the diagonal of that covariance. If we assume that the diagonal has ones from some point on, and then the, the first few elements are not equal to 1, then we're kind of in the position of saying, well, uh, in, in most directions, this is just noise. But there are some particular directions in which it's not this background white noise of unit variance. That's called the spiked model. I suppose on a college campus, 
Uh, people are aware of spiked punch that various fraternities might serve, the spiking agent being presumably ethanol. Uh, so, so this is our ethanol. The rest is just some sugary punch. Or to, to the rest of us, to, it's just noise, right? Unit variance, Gaussian noise in that particular direction. So we're going to maintain the other assumption, which is that we consider a sequence of problems where the aspect ratio of the data matrix tends to some shape factor beta. Uh, the terminology spiked is due to our co-author, Ian Johnstone, who introduced it about 15 years ago. Uh, then uh, an important theoretical paper that appeared in Annals of Probability by Jin Ho Bake, Gerard Benarus, and Sandrine Peche uh, uh, pointed out the fundamental observation that there's a, a surprise embedded in this model. Um, I don't have a picture of Sandrine Peche because she objects to having her picture on the internet. Um, but uh, she's definitely an equal contributor here. Uh, in fact, she was a lecturer at the International Congress of Mathematicians in Seoul in 2014. Has done a lot of good work on uh, random matrix theory. Um, so what happens in this model is that beyond the rth eigenspace, remember there's r spikes. So once you're beyond r, the joint distribution of the empirical eigenvalues again follows Marchenko-Pasteur, which is a, about the simplest thing that we could hope to be true. So those spikes don't change the bulk distribution of the eigenvalues. On the other hand, the initial eigenvalues corresponding to the spikes have a peculiar limiting behavior. They actually don't estimate what the, you think they ought to be estimating. Namely, the Li's are the true underlying variances in those directions, but the lambda i's don't tend to the Li's. They tend to something that's inflated that's too large by a certain definite amount that depends on the shape factor and the underlying theoretical eigenvalue. In addition, the eigenvectors themselves, if we let uin correspond to sample eigenvectors and, and ui, the population ones, then uh, it's going to turn out that the population eigenvectors are only kind of crudely estimated by the sample eigenvectors. And th this is a point that's extremely fundamental but not very well understood in the population of users in science and technology. That uh, if, if the number of rows and columns in your matrix is sort of comparable, the eigenvectors are not going to be that good of an estimate of what it is you think they're estimating. Instead, what you're going to see is that the cosine uh, between those two vectors, they're unit vectors sitting on the sphere, so it makes sense to measure their distance in terms of the cosine of the angle between them. Uh, that tends to a definite limit. Uh, and you know, in, it depends on the shape factor, and it depends on the eigenvalue. It only approaches one if the eigenvalue approaches infinity. And otherwise, what's going to happen is that it's not doing so well. Now, there's, there's other features which uh, I would like to point out. Actually, uh, there's uh, important provisos are left out of this slide, which I can't, you know, if I had a blackboard or something, I could fix this in real time. But there's a mistake on here in the, in the range of validity. Namely, if the LIs are uh, smaller than a particular limit, neither of these things is true. What happens if the Li's are too small is that the, the lambda i's tend to the bulk edge of the Marchenko-Pasteur distribution, and the, and the cosine of the angle tends to zero. So there's a so-called phase transition such that you end up with the eigenvalues uh, that you observe don't reflect in any way the underlying theoretical eigenvalues. The eigenvectors 
that you observe don't reflect in any way the underlying eigenvector. That's in, in sort of the bad phase. And in the good phase, the eigenvalues partially reflect the true underlying eigenvalue, but with distortion. And the eigenvectors partially reflect the true underlying eigenvector, but with distortion. All of these things are systematically understood. Uh, if we take into a, and and uh, okay, so the uh, the phase transition itself, for some reason, there's a missing formula there. I'm so sorry, but the, the phase transition itself for is that li equals one plus square root of beta, which is not something you would guess. It's not related to the other formulas present. It's a, it's exactly at that point that the eigenvalue that you observe starts to pop out of the bulk and you observe something happening uh, like with your naked eyes, that there's an eigenvalue there that's not part of the bulk. Um, in light of all of this, we can go back to the scree plot and we can say, OK, uh, this is the scree plot that we had for the Novambra data. But using Marchenko Pasteur and using the spike model and so on and so forth, we can now say, what is the expected scree plot for a white noise? And we can, uh, depending on the aspect ratio that we're involved with, we have different shapes of scree plots that we would have. Now, if you remember, uh, Professor Cattell, in his origination of the scree plot technique, suggested there was going to be this regime where you had a straight line, right? And he nicely drew that in. But uh, we know that's not the case. Instead, you're going to see something that's curvilinear. The particular curvature depends on the, the aspect ratio of the matrix that you're dealing with. And uh, it's quite a specific uh, shape that's given analytically in, in uh, a, a, an integral form. Uh, what does happen is that as beta goes to 0 or infinity, the shape becomes more and more like a straight line, kind of in the middle. It can't, can't really be a perfect straight line, but this is sort of like a straight line, except it still curves a little bit here. And that's at beta equals 0 0.25, which is matrix that's very tall. And, and it would be similar if we transposed it. You'd get a, a similar shape. Um, now, based on that, what a statistician would recommend is you shouldn't do the scree plot at all. Instead, what you should do is take the imp sorted empirical eigenvalues and plot them against the predictions that would come out of random matrix theory assuming a purely null model. The statisticians have been doing QQ plots like this like for 100 years. Uh, so when you do that using the Marchenko Pasteur, and this is a real data set. You know, it hasn't been cooked up out of some model or anything. This is, this is truly the, this is the data of about the uh, few thousand Europeans and their copy numbers. And wow, look at that. It's just pretty well matched there. The only, uh, the only thing we did in figuring this out is there's an, uh, there's an effect effective shape factor that had to be put in based on some work of uh, Patterson and Reich that's not the shape factor you would naively think because of something called linkage disequilibrium. It was a single parameter that had, to, the beta basically had to be adjusted for some correlations. Uh, but after you do that, uh, you see indeed there's some things that deviate from the quantile-quantile plot and then it makes perfect sense uh, to identify those as being important. And, and there's maybe four or five that are, that are important. Um, another thing, if you go back to this plot, you'll notice um, I had mentioned to you that the cosine between the underlying eigenvector and the true, uh, uh, the, the underlying true eigenvector and the empirically observed one, that cosine depends on the eigenvalue. And so if you have a strong eigenvalue, the two align better, whereas if you have a weak eigenvalue, they align worse. Well, the top two eigenvalues here are of different sizes. And so what you would predict is that the noise in the eigenvectors is anisotropic. 
And so in this plot, what you, what you ought to see is that PC1 is more well-determined than PC2. There should be more noise uh, in this direction and then in that one. And in fact, look, at Italy, we know that it's actually uh, this sort of elegant boot since time immemorial, as long as there have been maps, we've known that. But, but actually, this genomic data is good at, at locating you along PC1, not so good at locating you along PC2. And that's, that's exactly a consequence of this theory that says the second eigenvector is going to be noisier because the corresponding eigenvalue is smaller. And it can all be uh, worked out and, and made, uh, made to make sense. OK, so th those are some basics that have come out of random matrix theory. Now I would like to talk about how we can change some of our techniques of statistical uh, analysis and use of eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Before I do that, are there any questions about what I've shown you so far? OK, uh, so how am I doing for time? I feel I'm like way slower than I should be. Uh, Ooh, uh, OK. Um, OK, I'll just, this is going to be like a lightning tour. Um, matrix denoising, imagine you have a low rank matrix with noise that uh, gets added together. Uh, to produce some observations, and you want to recover the low rank matrix. Um, a particular procedure you can do is take the singular values, uh, shrink them according to some uh, specified scalar nonlinearity, and then uh, replace the core of the decomposition with those shrunken values, and then rebuild an approximate matrix. Uh, if we adopt this, the obvious spiked model in this setting, there would be noise, it, there would be an additive term, and then there would be singular values of the low rank piece. And uh, you can check in MATLAB if you like that you could, uh, for example, generate data of that form. And you can see a scree plot with a simple plot, and you can see that the the low rank structure that you put in will pop out if it's appropriately large. In this particular case, we're dealing with square matrix. And the main information in this plot I'd like you to see is that uh, the bulk of the eigenvalues ends at about 2. See, there's this, this limb here that ends at about 2. That's where the bulk ends. And, and then these two eigenvalues, uh, these are singular values. They stick out beyond 2. Uh, the take-home recipe that we could promote in this setting is if you have a square matrix that you're, that you're trying to denoise, it's convenient to uh, normalize it so the noise level is 1 over root n. If you're presuming to truncate, just try to find a few singular values and keep those so you think those are signal, there's one unique place to do it which was not suggested in the literature before all of this came along. It's that, 4 over square root of 3. Uh, that's at about 2.3. Now, the bulk edge is at 2. So we're saying that in a, in a completely convincing sense, you shouldn't threshold at the bulk edge. Instead, you should uh, get uh, beyond it. Uh, by a certain amount, and that's because the eigenvectors or singular vectors that you're using are so noisy just around the bulk edge that they're doing more harm than good. So whereas there's a presumption out there that if you can show statistical significance, namely your empirical eigenvalue or empirical singular value just gets a little bit outside the bulk, the presumption is you should use it. But that's wrong. You shouldn't. And the reason is there's so much noise in the, in the included singular vector that you would suffer. Uh, if you can, you should shrink 
the singular values rather than threshold them. And then the proposal is that you should use something with uh, this particular form of nonlinearity. Now, of course, if, the, if sigma is not known to you, you can take the median of the observed singular values and normalize them according to simple formula to do that. Uh, there's a lot of stuff associated with denoising that people have suggested. I'm not trying to keep you from looking at it. Uh, but just because of time, I'm going to focus on an example. Uh, so as I said, there's a one particular value of threshold that makes sense. No other value makes sense. And in particular, if you look at the uh, mean squared error of reconstructing a low rank matrix, the traditional thing of, of thresholding at the bulk edge has a performance that's given by this red curve as a function of the singular value. What we're telling you you need to do is at the blue curve. The blue curve is, is always below or equal to the red curve no matter what the singular value is. That's why it's the right one to use. And no matter what other threshold you pick, it would be equal to or below. And that's why this is the unique uh, acceptable choice. Uh, this is an easy approach to use, and it makes sense simply because the uh, singular vectors and, and eigenvectors are so noisy when, when you get close to the bulk edge. Uh, there's, for the optimal shrinkage can be uh, different depending on what your norm is for wanting to reconstruct. If you're reconstructing in Frobenius or operator or nuclear norm, you get different nonlinearities that are qualitatively the same. Here would be hard thresholding at the bulk edge, and here would be the nonlinearities that are actually optimal ones to use. Um, okay, so now I probably have five minutes. Uh, high dimensional covariance estimation. I'll just mention, uh, you know, this is a, another big problem. Uh, many of you in engineering. Uh, will be aware of Wiener filtering and the idea of trying to uh, trade off between signal and noise across the eigen components using Carhun and Loeb transformation. So that's a, an application one could mention. There are other applications where you'd like to know covariance in order to do the right uh, thing with your data, empirical finance. Uh, portfolio allocation would be one, and machine learning classification would be one. Um, eigenvalue shrinkage would be that we form an empirical covariance, and then we shrink those eigenvalues uh, before rebuilding an approximate covariance. The idea that this is the right way to go uh, is at least 60 years old. Uh, it was first carefully understood by Charles Stein as being a possibility in uh, uh, 1956. But since then, there are hundreds and hundreds of papers about ideas of how to shrink the eigenvalues of covariance matrices to get something that's good for different pro purposes. Now, um, if you have a loss function for your matrix that measures the quality of your matrix, then you can derive, uh, at least in principle, uh, the right way to shrink for the given set of underlying eigenvalues. And it turns out that you, know, you can, because this spiked model leads to the analysis, you can, uh, for many, many different ways of uh, talking about uh, discrepancy based on different norms and different ways of comparing matrices, you can come up with uh, precise closed form expressions for the right way to shrink the eigenvalues to achieve your exact purpose. And that, that purpose could be something associated with you know, a denoising problem. It could be associated with a portfolio allocation problem, et cetera. Um, some of the different solutions that emerge from this, there, there are uh, about 31 different solutions I'm aware of, of different kinds of shrinkers that come out of this theory that uh, 
not just our team, but other teams have also derived. And, and you can see there's a quite a wide range of shrinkage formulas that have been derived for uh, dealing with the eigenvalues of covariance matrices. Again, this is all due to the fact that the underlying matrix has not very accurate eigenvectors, and so you're protecting yourself from the consequences of the noisiness of those eigenvectors. You're also protecting yourself from the consequences of the bias that's embedded in the eigenvalues. Uh, just, I don't have time for too much. I'll mention one very recent piece of work. Beruz Gorbani, a graduate student at Stanford and I have worked on a problem called multi-user covariance estimation. Um, this is something relevant in empirical finance. It would also be relevant in machine learning. I don't have time to explain the full connections. Um, in empirical finance, there are organizations that essentially produce covariance matrices and sell them to users um, who then use those to perform mean variance optimization. And uh, it turns out that this can be framed and, uh, in this way that a, a, a very interesting thing an organization like that ought to be doing is looking at condition number loss on a pivot that compares the true and empirical distribution uh, of eigenvalues using this way of combining matrices. Um, it turns out that if you could solve this, you would be protecting all of your users against disappointment in the so-called sharp ratio. So uh, this is an example where uh, you can derive the optimal uh, shrinkage of the eigenvalues and protect all your users in an optimal fashion. I, 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 you know, there's plots of this which I can't go over because of time. Uh, I'll simply summarize a little bit of what we've gone through and then the original articles may be a good source for you to follow up on something that you'd like to follow up on. We, we've seen that eigen analysis and singular value decomposition are of great importance throughout science and technology. Uh, we've seen that the spiked model is something we can easily describe and give people intuition about. We've seen there's been great progress in this. We now understand how the scree plot is, is not precisely accurate as a heuristic. We know what to do better in terms of processing the eigenvalues either to decide where to chop in truncation or to decide how to shrink. We can do this uh, whether we're talking about denoising a matrix or improving a covariance estimate. Now, uh, I haven't had time today to talk about it, but there's been a lot of progress in dealing with non-white noise. And uh, with you know, a whole separate hour, we could go in detail into the underlying calculations that generalize everything here beyond white noise. Uh, in addition, there's a lot of progress in going outside the case of the spike model, and I'll mention papers by Olivier Ledois, Sandrine Pichet, and Michael Wolf that could be consulted uh, if you think you don't have the kind of factor structure that's embedded here. Uh, I'm sorry for skipping so much material. Somehow I'm just not as quick as I might be on giving this talk, and uh, I appreciate the attention that you've paid today. So thanks to Professor Donahoe for a great talk. And are there any questions? Uh, yes, Mike. So you uh, talked about eigenvalue shrinkage. And I'm wondering if uh, sort of equivariance assumptions make it hopeless to make any adjustments to the eigenvectors. And along those lines, you could comment on the utility of sparse PCA. So I was asked what to do about eigenvectors and what about sparse eigenvectors? Um, so there's, uh, so the, you're totally right. What we've said here is just about how to adjust eigenvalues to do better and you just have to suffer 
whatever is in the eigenvectors, whatever bad is there, you just have to suffer. Uh, and uh, there isn't any guidance coming out of the spiked model what to do, but as you've suggested, uh, if you know the structure of the eigenvectors in some way, you can improve the situation. So sparse PCA tries to say, well, the eigenvectors probably are just going to be loading on a small fraction of coordinates. So let's just identify the coordinates that seem to stick up, be much larger than the other ones, and then set all the other ones to zero. When, when that model, which it is a model, when that's you know, correct, uh, there's maybe 100 papers, I'm guessing, over the last couple years that uh, give you assurances and, and tweaks and so on so that you can do a much better job in that case. So if you're, if you're willing uh, to impose structure on the uh, uh, pseudo eigenvectors that you're, being, that you're using based on an understanding that the empirical ones have noise where they should have a certain kind of structure, uh, you can do better by imposing your model. And when you do that, as you said, uh, you lose equivariance, which is kind of a mathematical buzzword that just says it, it doesn't matter whether the data are presented to you in, in any specific coordinate system. Uh, you get a coordinate-free result for the final one. That goes away once you start using models on the eigenvectors. Uh, I don't know an alternative to that. Thank you. I think there was one more question there. In certain optimization, sometimes you get a solution. In some situations, you get a solution where you do diagonal loading rather than suppressing and add an offset to your eigenvalues to get a stable matrix inverse. Any interactions between one to shrink, one to load, or a mix of the two? Oh, thank you. That's a great question. So um, what we've spoken about here, just from time limitations, is you could either essentially keep the, the empirical eigenvalues as they are and then set all the other ones equal to some common value. That's one strategy. Uh, or you could uh, modify the upper eigenvalues according to you know, a smooth function that can be derived by an optimality theory. There's, in reality, many other things you could do so that there are linear shrinkage procedures, there's sort of uh, soft thresholding, which to machine learning looks like a ReLU. There's many different strategies that you, that you could consider and that I didn't have time to discuss. Uh, there are papers discussing those, and, uh, and they can be surprisingly good uh, in certain situations. So as an example, in the portfolio allocation problem that I mentioned, the, the paper with Behrouz Gorbani, I th what we found is that a soft thresholding that puts all the eigenvalues below a certain level to a constant, and then after that goes off linearly at a specific slope that's based on the shape factor of the matrix, that comes within a few percent uh, in the performance measure that we use of the optimal shrinkage, which is much more complicated to specify. You know, it's, it's some general smooth function. So you just you just have you know constant and then linear can come very close to optimal in that setting. It sounds like that's something close to what your people are doing. Uh, I don't know the, you know, this, this is being documented carefully as an optimal strategy under certain assumptions, uh, but obviously you could have many other reasons for following that particular model. Uh, and maybe some of those uh, we could discuss at some point. Thank you. One question over here. Can you talk about the classical case when the number of parameters are fixed? And also the, the high dimensional case when the number of observations and the number of parameters are, are of the same order? And I was wondering if you've witnessed any interesting phenomenon when both the number of parameters and the number of observations goes to infinity, but in such a way that the aspect ratio goes to zero in some particular way. So for instance, you have more observations than parameters, but still your parameters are going 
uh, to infinity and maybe, you know, the number of yeah. observations is the square of your number of parameters or, or something along these lines? These are such good questions. Um, uh, so first of all, uh, the model where the matrix is extremely wide and thin was uh, not was in evidence multiple times during this talk because some of the data sets that were actually looked at corresponded to you know like a, a quarter million by a thousand or something. It's 250 times wider than than it is tall. So that correspond to beta equals 250. Um, some of these nonlinearities have meaningful limits as beta goes to infinity, and there have been papers about that. I think Junxing Fan of Princeton and his co-authors wrote a paper pointing out that out of these 31 closed forms, you know, about half of them have meaningful limits. Um, you know, so the, the, if, if you need one of those specific goal functions for you, then there would be a special thing to do for matrices with many, many variables and not so many observations. Okay, one last question. Uh, in single processing, we use covalence matrix for some, something like Gaussian distribution formulation. And in noisy speech recognition, a lot of people already uh, use, uh, try to uh, reduce the covalence, the, the valence value uh, in this uh, Gaussian distribution uh, to adapt it to the noisy environment. But they only specifically uh, deal, deal with those uh, 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 valence value instead of eigenvalue. Yeah. Is there any difference uh, using re reduction of the valence value or uh, we have to go to the eigenvalue and come back to the valence? Another good question, boy. Uh, the question is, can you get uh, so it's, it's common to shrink a data vector by a scalar operation or to treat a covariance of, as if it's just a scalar times the identity. Those would be some, some uh, you know, uh, simple uh, operations you could do. And the question is, what's the benefit of treating a full covariance as if it really has you know, all, this, all this eigenstructure and treating all the eigenvalues according to some uh, carefully thought through limit? So, um, it, it, it depend, it's problem dependent. So in the, in the portfolio uh, allocation example, it turns out that you know, in some, if you have many, many stocks and not so many days, then uh, things can get so bad that basically what you suggest of just using scalar operations is pretty much the only thing you can do. And, and you know, the theory tells you that. It sort of shows you, uh, don't even try to estimate a covariance here, just go to a scalar. Uh, so uh, I imagine that in the signal processing setting, if we had the right formulation of it, we could get the theory to tell us, yeah, there are situations in signal processing where the vector is very high dimensional and we can't really estimate the covariance. So we just estimate some overall average variance and normalize by a scalar. Uh, I, I, I can see that coming out of this type of theory in, in the beta goes to infinity case quite easily. OK, let's thank Professor Donohue again for a great talk. <laughs>